Hi, everyone. I'm Jess Blankshane. I teach in the National Security Affairs Department at the U.S. Naval War College. Everything I'm about to say represents my own views, not those of my employer. Today, we're going to introduce foreign policy analysis. This is intended to complement your assigned readings from chapters one and two of your decision making in American foreign policy textbook. So what is foreign policy analysis? Foreign policy analysis refers to an academic subfield of international relations, but more broadly, it's what policymakers, policy advisors, and policy analysts do when they try to understand how policy is made and what the result of different policies are or might be. So essentially what we're trying to do is understand cause and effect relationships, the relationships between policy making processes and the policies, actions, decisions that result from them, and then the relationships between those policies or actions and outcomes in the real world. But in doing this, it's important to remember that this always involves uncertainty. We don't live in a deterministic world where we can usually understand exactly what's going to happen uh, from A to B. So instead, we think about this in probabilistic terms and try to come up with uh, an understanding of general tendencies and likely effects. Now, there are a number of different reasons that you might do this kind of analysis. And one way to think about what you're doing when you analyze something is to think about whether you're analyzing something before or after it happens and whether you're doing what social scientists would call descriptive or normative analysis. And by those terms, what we mean is that descriptive analysis is trying to understand how things are in the world as it exists, while normative analysis is making value judgments about how things should be, what would be good. And so on your screen, you see a little two by two that intersects these two dimensions to help us think about the type of analysis we're doing. So in terms of descriptive analysis, if you're doing that before something happens, you're predicting. You're trying to predict what the likely outcome of a process or a policy might be. If you're doing it after something has happened, then you're trying to explain what happened, how to understand the relationships that got us to where we are. Similarly, with normative analysis, if you're doing that before something happens, you're advocating for or against a particular process or policy. If you're doing it after something happens, then you're evaluating that process or that policy, whether it was good or bad, whether things should have been done that way or a different way. And in this class, we're mostly going to be working in the top line of this little table. We're going to be doing descriptive analysis, trying to predict and explain things that happen in the world rather than trying to evaluate uh, what is good or bad or what should or shouldn't have happened. Now, to do this type of analysis, we often use models or frameworks. And by that, we just mean a set of simplifying assumptions about the world that let us focus on particular aspects of a case or a policy so that we can get a better sense of how things work. In this course, we're going to focus on three major uh, frameworks or sets of theories. Levels of analysis, which is a framework for organizing theories based on Ken Waltz's work, thinking about the causes of war. What we're going to call analytical perspectives on foreign policy decision making, which are an expanded version of Graham Allison's models of governmental decision making that tries to uh, adapt to how things have changed in government uh, since the late 1960s and 1970s when Allison originally developed his models. And then finally, two-level games, which are based on Robert Putnam's theory of the interaction of domestic politics and international relations. So next, we're going to quickly preview each of these uh, frameworks or theories. We'll go through most of them in much more detail later in the course. And then we'll talk about how they all fit together to form sort of a toolkit for conducting foreign policy analysis. So as I mentioned, levels of analysis is essentially a very broad framework for organizing different theories or explanations of how the world works. And this is based on work that Waltz did in investigating possible causes of war. And it essentially categorizes explanations or theories 
based on sort of where they operate, where they focus in the world. So at the top level, we have the systematic or the systemic or international level, which focuses on interactions between states in this global system and looks at explanations that focus on things like how states respond to their environment in terms of relative power, uh, technological or environmental opportunities and constraints, those sort of big picture things. At the next level, we have the state and societal level explanations, which focus on the structure of states themselves, their type of government, the prevailing political culture or ideology in the state, the way that its governmental institutions and organizations are structured, their culture, how those things might influence policy and events in the world. And then finally, at the lowest level, we have the individual level, which looks at individuals. And primarily these sorts of explanations and theories are going to focus on leaders of countries and how their backgrounds and experiences and ideologies might shape their decision making and influence what they do in the world. Next, we have our set of analytical perspectives to try to understand foreign policy decision making. Now in this course, we're mostly going to be focused on the United States. So we'll be talking about these within the context of the United States government. And as I mentioned, these are based off Graham Allison's original models for understanding governmental decision-making. And we've refined and adapted them uh, to, we think better capture the way that the world works today. So quickly, I will walk through each of these, but again, we'll go through them in much more detail later. And what each of these perspectives essentially does is it focuses us on a particular actor that is doing something to make policy and a behavior by which they are making policy. So the first, the unitary state perspective, which is analogous to Graham Allison's rational actor model, focuses on the state as an actor. So the United States or China can be said to make a decision or to do something. And that state is assumed to behave by optimizing. It considers all of the options available to it and it picks the best one in terms of the one that is most likely to achieve its desired results to serve its interests. Next, we have the organizational process perspective. This considers the actors to be organizations within a government and these organizations act by processing information and initiating action based on pre-existing procedures and their organizational culture. So essentially policy is output from these organizational machines. Next, we have the bureaucratic politics perspective, which again looks at organizations, but considers them as represented by individuals, usually their heads, who are in positions to represent these organizations. And what these organizations as represented by their leaders do is bargain with one another to produce resultant compromise policies that reflect their bureaucratic interests. Now, we also have what we call the sub-bureaucratic politics perspective, which is sort of a refinement on the bureaucratic politics perspective or um, sort of a, another layer to it, which moves down beyond just looking at top level organizations and their leaders to consider all of the sub organizations and divisions within these organizations and how they interact and overlap. So here we're looking primarily at issue areas represented by people in positions who work on those issues and the way that those individuals bargain with one another, often to set the context for what more senior decision makers will be doing. Next, we have what we call the palace politics perspective, which focuses on individuals, mostly the key advisors surrounding a decision maker. So in our case, frequently the president. And we look at how they try to influence or persuade the decision maker in terms of policy making. Finally, we have the cognitive perspective, which again focuses at the individual level here, usually focusing on the head of state, the decision maker themselves, and looking at how those individuals process information through their existing cognitive frames and based on their worldviews. So again, that was a very quick introduction of these theories. We'll go through all of them in significantly more detail. And it's again, just like with levels of analysis, important to remember that the point of these sort of organizational schema is not to say that one level or one perspective is right, but rather to help us think about 
uh, events and policies more broadly and consider all of the different factors and influences that might contribute. So finally, we have Putnam's two-level games, which gives us a conceptual way to think about the interaction between domestic and international politics. This theory essentially views foreign policy as the result of a set of overlapping negotiations. Countries negotiate with each other internationally, usually represented by a lead negotiator, but that lead negotiator then also has to turn back to their domestic constituencies uh, who are also bargaining and negotiating to determine what policies are going to be acceptable domestically. And so these overlapping bargaining games determine what policy will be. So while the analytical perspectives really focused us on inside the government, how decision making was happening, this brings us back to look at the external influences on that government, both domestic and international, that are going to influence policy making. And it also reminds us that even if we're particularly focused on analyzing one particular government, in our case, the United States, we need to take into account other countries' domestic situations and policy making processes too. So putting it all together, academic theories aren't necessarily meant to fit together nicely. They weren't always developed that way. Uh, for an example here, uh, Walt and Putnam number their levels differently, which can be very confusing. But we chose these theories to focus on in the course because we think they do work together in important ways to give us a sort of conceptual toolkit to analyze foreign policy. So if you see on your screen here, moving from left to right, on the left, we have levels of analysis, which is our broad framework for categorizing theories and explanations at the systemic state or individual level. Then we have the analytical perspectives, which you can think of as fitting into these levels. Uh, the unitary state perspective operates primarily at the systemic or international level, looking at how states interact with each other, responding to outside influences, the organizational process, bureaucratic politics, and sub-bureaucratic politics really focus on the state and societal level, the way that these institutions and organizations are structured, and the way that they act and influence policy. And then finally, the palace politics and cognitive perspectives are focused at the individual level on the behavior of the people within these governments and how they might affect policy. And then finally, over on the right, we have two level games, which helps us think about integrating explanations at these different levels, thinking about how they interact with one another. So at the systemic level, we have these international negotiations between countries. We know those are interacting with domestic negotiations within the countries, looking at all of the constituents uh, and that's going to be influenced by the system of government, the institutions, the organizations, the culture of that country. And then finally, we have a lead negotiator, frequently multiple lead negotiators for the different parties, who is an individual trying to balance all of these uh, different competing interests and channel them into some sort of uh, negotiated policy. So that was your very brief introduction to foreign policy analysis. Thanks so much for watching. I will be back to talk about the unitary state perspective in more detail.